Well, let's get started. Um, I'm David Nace, Dr. David Nace, Chief Medical Officer here at Innovacer, and I am so excited about welcoming all of you to today's webinar, Embracing Health Equity. Um, and we have a number of great panelists here to discuss this important topic. So without any ado, let's get started. Uh, I'd first like to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. David Nash, founding Dean Emeritus at Jefferson College of Population Health. Uh, David, welcome. And if you could just take a minute and uh, say a little bit about uh, what you're doing at Jefferson. Sure. Great to be together, David Nace and David Nash, just to confuse everybody. <laughs> and uh, wonderful to be a part of this program. And welcome to Angela and Kelly as well. Uh, so, David Nace, I'm uh, still at Jefferson, uh, going on year 32 now. Uh, right now, I'm uh, Dean Emeritus of our College of Population Health. I'm on an endowed chair in health policy and uh, still working full time and rolling the rock uphill. And one of the rocks we're rolling uphill is to reduce disparities in care. So I'm looking forward to the program. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, Kelly Garrison. Kelly is the CEO of Empiro Health in North Carolina, a management service organization doing that work in value-based care. Uh, Kelly, uh, welcome and share a little bit about what you're doing at Empiro. Thanks, Dr. Nace, and to Dr. Nash. We need to call y'all like DN squared or something. Right, I guess Angel and I are, are messing that up today, but um, it is great to be here. And um, I'm Kelly Garrison, the president and CEO of Imperio Health. We are a, a management services company or pop health company really focused on the Medicaid population, um, which is why I'm so excited to be here and participate with my fellow panelists this afternoon. I think um, even as we uh, in North Carolina have recently transitioned to Medicaid managed care, we saw this opportunity and this shift to the managed care environment as just that as an opportunity to really look at, um, evaluate, address, and hopefully move the needle on the disparities that we see and have seen for a long time in our community, especially as we start to see alignment, hopefully, of value initiatives when it comes to um, managing the disparities that exist in our community. So excited to be here um, with you all this afternoon. Fabulous, fabulous. And Dr. Angela Shippey, a senior physician executive at the nonprofit healthcare group at Amazon Web Services. Uh, wow, that's exciting. Angela, welcome. And if you could share a little bit about the nonprofit healthcare group of AWS, you've got us all curious. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I look forward to really talking about this topic. So yes, I'm the senior physician executive, the nonprofit healthcare group at AWS, really where we're helping nonprofit entities reimagine how they deliver care. And very specifically, as, it be, as we talk about health equity, very interested in taking all the disparate data that we have, bringing it together so that we can have targeted interventions that really eliminate the health inequities that we know. So very excited to talk more about this and dive deeper into the topic. Awesome, awesome. So uh, with that said, great group, great panel uh, discussion upcoming and let's get into it. So um, I was thinking just the other day about, you know, in 2001, when the then Institute of Medicine released its report, a series of reports in 09 and 01, uh, terror is human, and then crossing the quality chiasm. Uh, I think, David, you and I knew each other uh, around that time. And, you know, we were all excited about, oh my gosh, look at this big gap, this big chiasm in quality of health care and the disparities therein, and so much work to do. And, you know, fast forward today, we had a, a couple episodes to get this right. You know, we, we had in 09, a great recession. We spent a lot of money trying to digitalize health care. Uh, we created the EMRs, uh, still working at interoperability, and I had some uh, both positive and negative impact. And yet here we go through another episode of the pandemic, and it just highlighted this issue of inequity. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, this is a definition of health equity, the absence of avoidable differences between socioeconomic and demographic groups or geographic areas in health status and health outcomes such as disease or mortality, quite a mouthful. Uh, let's get into a little bit about what this is all about and why we're talking about it today. 
Uh, Kelly, let's start with you. Sure, I, I think it's it. We have to highlight the fact that over the last two years we've been dealing with a pandemic. Um, it's hard to believe. Sometimes it feels like yesterday, and other times it feels like it's been years that we've been in this space. And you know, I think we all probably early on thought, well, oh, this is just two weeks away from being over, and two weeks became two weeks from being two months. Now here we sit two years. And I know several months into the, the COVID-19 pandemic, I was sitting at home and I was with my children who were you know at home and not in school and I'm trying to work and, and trying to juggle all of the, the things that we as, as working parents were doing at the time. And it hit me all of a sudden in thinking about, you know, wow, we have an environment to be safe at home, um, we have the resources to respond if myself, my family, my children were not. Um, and we immediately as a, as a company that worked in the Medicaid space started really thinking about what does this mean for our population? Um, you know, I have a, a team of care managers and navigators that help patients every day to navigate this incredibly complex environment that we are all working in. And we immediately started kind of shifting our thoughts towards how do we now support our patients in what we don't even aren't even experts in. None of us knew, quite frankly, what COVID means meant, what it was going to mean short term, long term. Um, but what we knew is that all of a sudden children that normally got their, their food in schools weren't in schools to get food anymore. We all of a sudden were slammed with the fact that um, people were afraid to go to their doctor's offices. And so we talk a lot in this pop health space of getting upstream, like we are still a very reactive healthcare society. And our goal is eventually to, to get to that upstream space. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, we aren't even seeing the patients that need us the most because they're afraid to come into our offices, our you know, primary care offices for even the most basic and routine care. So in, in some ways, I think COVID taught us a lot. I also think it energized the healthcare community in a way because we um, very quickly had to shift to remote work and virtual health and telehealth and things like that, that I hope we've learned a lot of lessons from that we'll be able to carry forward. But I think what's for me, if I was thinking about kind of a summary of thinking about health equity and what does that mean, it, it, it really is those opportunities, not just thinking about how do people access our healthcare system, um, but it is what are the opportunities or the things that keep patients from being healthy. So it is access to food, it is safe and affordable housing, it's education, it's all of those things and how do they work together um, and, and how do we as healthcare providers and those in this space stitch that fabric together in order to drive meaningful outcomes for patient populations. Wow, that's an uh, awesome perspective. Mm -hmm. David, I heard that word upstream. I've heard you use that. Yeah, boy, Kelly did it's such a great job. Uh, well, colleagues, you're talking to somebody from uh, ground zero of health inequality, and that is the great city of Philadelphia, founding city of our country, home of the first hospital, home of the first medical school, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what this means in our part of the world. So Philadelphia is the poorest city of the nation's top 10 cities by population, whereby one in four people live in poverty. And of those, one half live in deep poverty, meaning they can't put food on the table. So despite the fact that we have four academic medical centers, Jefferson, Temple, uh, Penn and Drexel. And remember that Jefferson Medical College, Sydney Kimball Medical College, and Drexel University College of Medicine are the two largest private medical schools in America. They're walking distance from one another. Despite that, our population in our county of Philadelphia is the sickest population in the great state of Pennsylvania. So, David, Inequality is a day-to-day -day part of what we tackle in Philadelphia. Just to sum up, we're the poorest on a per capita basis and everything flows from that. The sad realities of lack of educational opportunities, crime, uh, lack of food, all of these conspire to make our population uh, unhealthy uh, despite the resources that the four major academic medical centers represent. And by the way, healthcare services is the biggest business 
in our city. So it's a, just a very sad part of our day to day and something our College of Population Health started sincerely understanding and writing and doing something about now more than a decade ago, but it's an uphill battle. No, that's uh, very illustrative of uh, and a great example of a great city that is struggling with solving this very problem. Um, uh, Angela, you know, a lot of people might be wondering, Amazon Web Services, <laughs> AWS, um, what's their interest in this and uh, why the uh, standing up of a nonprofit group and uh, focusing on this issue of health equity? Uh, enlighten us all. We're very interested. Sure, I think that's a great question. And I love what David and Kelly just talked about, because when you think about it, go back to pre-COVID. If you went to a conference in 2019, most likely on the agenda was some discussion about health equity, health inequity, social determinants of health. So we were talking about it in 2019, early 2020, and then COVID hit. And what it did is it really highlighted for all of us within the healthcare ecosystem that the health status, the baseline health status made a big difference in terms of your vulnerability, whether it was because you, ha you had poor health, chronic disease, or because of the type of work you did or where you lived. And so it highlighted that need to really focus in on health equity during COVID. And so now where we are, and I think David gives a really good example of this. We have so much information about the populations that we serve, whether it's private entities, organizations within a community, it's health, it's um, medical schools, it's public health entities. There's all this information about the communities that are being served, but it doesn't always come together. And clearly during COVID, one of the things that most communities did very well was sharing information and sharing data. So if we take Philadelphia as an example, if you think about bringing together everything you know about the community, all the data that comes from each one of those entities, then bring in the other public health resources. And now you have information that you can bring together and then target the interventions that are needed. So if you think about COVID, we were able to say which communities were in need. Did they need information? Did they need PPE? Did they need access to medications, to treatment, access to get a ride, to get a vaccine? We were very targeted in how we, in, how we looked at the inequities and how we could fix them. That's exactly what we need to do going forward. And that's exactly what within the um, nonprofit healthcare group and other healthcare groups within AWS, what we want to achieve. How do we bring that data together to have really good insights to target the populations and give them the relief and the better health that they deserve? And that's awesome. David, you know, that, that, and that makes me think about this next question is, you know, we talked about this for a long time, and I mentioned this going back to 09 and 2001 when, you know, the Institute of Medicine at that time gave these reports, and yet it continues to be an elusive ball. And we've talked about social determinants of health since Robert Wood Johnson and others, have, you know, really enlightened us about this. Um, what are some of the barriers? Now, I, I, I'm curious because we're leading medical schools ivory towers of training and research. Uh, and yet all of these things Angela just talked about and, and Kelly alluded to as an experience, they're a challenge. What are the challenges? Yeah, well, what a great question. It's got a very sad answer though, David. And that is that, uh, you know, why is it continue to be an elusive goal? Well, the economic reality is that there is no incentive to improve health or very little incentive. Uh, uh, let's take a step back. So the healthcare system, our non-system, 20% of the GDP, $4 trillion a year. Let's just stop there. Uh, one quarter of that $4 trillion, a trillion dollars is of no value. So the system is not designed to actually improve health. The system is designed to deliver health care services. That does not include, therefore, tackling the disparity and equity issues. The system is a rational economic actor, given the way the incentives are organized, which is a fancy way of saying there's very little money in tackling these disparities if you're paid to produce a service. 
And the more you're paid piecework, the more piecework we will do. So to me, the answer to question one is really the system is upside down and backwards, needs a complete reorientation. Uh, we've lost our true north, which in my view is improving health. Uh, once we start to understand that that's the true north and we pay accordingly, then and only then, in my opinion, will we be able to tackle the disparity and the equity issues. It, it's a sad commentary. Uh, I think uh, Jefferson has done a, as good a job as any big academic center to begin to tackle these issues. As uh, folks know, and Angela pointed out, COVID shined a spotlight on something that uh, we all knew which was the system had these disparities and inequality, and it just exacerbated what was already a structural problem. And it's no surprise then that the disadvantaged communities suffered so disproportionately, uh, no primary care doctors, no linkage, no internet, can't do telehealth, unbelievable levels of obesity and cardiovascular disease, should I continue? So given that we paid such modest attention to those issues prior, COVID just made this a literally, you know, a front page story for two years running. So maybe there's hope, maybe we'll get to that later. But to me, uh, it's an elusive goal because it's not part of how we get paid. And our goal is to deliver healthcare services, sadly, not to improve health. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Angela, you talked about Geez, I think uh, if you could get the data and information from the community, from the economic, environmental, uh, and social constructs the patient lives in or the community lives in, maybe we could provide insights, right, to people to tackle this. But given these economic disincentives they would have talked about, how do you see this from your perspective at AWS uh, coming together? Right. And what I would say as someone who has lived this um, alongside many of my healthcare colleagues, what I would say is that for an individual hospital or health system provider at the time, it really is about the care of the one that's in front of you. And it's been our public health entities and partners who have been responsible for the care of many. So going forward, we all have to have that, that mindset that it's the care of many. We're interested in the health of an entire population or an entire community. And in that we can definitely get better in delivering that care. The other thing I would say is, I think there's a real opportunity here. Instead of waiting for the regulatory process that ultimately will come as it relates to health equity, how do we get in front of it right now? As, as providers, as healthcare entities, as all of us that are in this healthcare ecosystem, how do we start to think about impacts from social determinants of health, from the overall health um, of a population and start to say, how will we chip away at these inequities so we get to a better health status? Let's be a little bit more proactive about it instead of waiting for it to happen. Now, that makes sense. Uh, Kelly, uh, you work deeply with the community in North Carolina. Um, I remember when I was at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center as a faculty person, working in the community who would say, well, that ivory tower over there, the academic medical center doesn't really know about us and what we're dealing with. Uh, what's the view today around hope and the issues we just talked about, collecting data, insights, uh, economic incentives? What's the view of the community that you're experiencing and hearing? About? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of uh, follow-ups there. I think one, Dr. Nash is exactly right. Our, our, the way that the economics work right now don't really incentivize um, the work that needs to happen to address these SDOH issues. We in North Carolina actually have some really, what I believe, exciting work happening um, uh, as a part of our transition to Medicaid managed care last July. Part of our 1115 waiver brought forth a $650 million investment over five years into what they're calling healthy opportunities pilots. Um, 
our former DHHS Secretary Mandy Cohen is probably familiar to, to all of you and, uh, and many of the, our, our colleagues on the, on the webinar today. And her philosophy kind of when this vision was set out is it's time to buy health, not just health care. And so that's what you know, Dr. Shippey was talking about is we're not just talking about buying health care services now and seeing that one patient in front of us. We have to look at this from a broader perspective in order to get upstream. So this is kind of how, how all of these things tie together. Um, and I think that that is exactly right. So through this investment that is happening in North Carolina, there's just three kind of small regions right now. Ideally, we get some good research and data um, that can be utilized to inform future processes. But essentially, there's a fee schedule that comes along with the delivery of certain services. So, OK, a patient needs food, then we're going to figure out how we buy them food and, and not just food. Um, you know, I've spent a number of hours myself volunteering at food banks. And as I pack up boxes full of, um, you know, pasta and macaroni and cheese and ramen noodles, I think that it's great for some things, but not for my diabetic patients or my hypertensive patients. Um, you know, but it, it's the accessibility to the right foods based on the patient's conditions, based on what they have access to cook it with. Um, so there's lots of things that happen, um, you know, as a result of communities coming together. I think goal alignment that is informed by data is going to be critical. Um, but but I think, quite frankly, until the community sees an ongoing, lasting investment, involvement, engagement, and quite frankly, listening, I think one of the things that I feel like I have learned and that our organization strives to do is not come up with the solutions for the community and tell them what they need to do or how they need to access the healthcare system. But it really is about being entrenched in the communities, listening to our patients, listening to the struggles that they have, and then figuring out how to address them because we can sit in, in ivory towers and offices and come up with amazing plans but that's why I think so many times they fall flat when we try to implement them and we we don't understand why patients aren't, aren't coming to the new building on the corner or that kind of thing but it, it really is about understanding the communities and what's important to them and taking our services and healthcare to where they are um, versus expecting them to come to us. That was an exciting discussion uh, and it's a uh, uh... You know, great to hear about the incentives that are being provided, at least at the policy level and at the state level in North Carolina. Uh, let's move on to starting to look at some solutions here. So one area to be involved, I've heard about data already several times, is starting to take data and making it useful, maybe starting with some quality measures. So how do we think about quality measures as it relates to SDOH? How do we get use of that data? And Angela, I'd like to come back to you. We've been hearing about economic incentives, and I know that AWS has been in, uh, interested and has a program in place. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that program and then how it might relate to how we measure uh, quality when it comes to these social, environmental, and economic issues that we uh, know drive healthcare outcomes. Absolutely. Thank you for that, David. So one of the initiatives we have right now is in health equity, trying to better understand where there are opportunities for access, social determinants of health, how we can have interventions. And so we right now are sponsoring um, health system uh, proof of concepts and, and work in health equity with uh, credits to use on AWS, $250,000 worth. And so we want to do that because we need to better understand exactly where to target. And let me give you an example of that. So right now, if you look at um, value-based purchasing measures. That's some of the key measures that are giving health systems and hospitals problems right now are readmissions and mortality. So if you were able to dive deeper into those particular disease processes um, for mortality and readmissions, you would start to peel back the onion and find out some of the reasons why these patients are not doing as well is related to their access to care, their access to food, whether or not they have food insecurity. Are they able to have transportation to get to and from their appointments? Do they have overall health literacy that allows them to understand how they take their medicines? What are the particular risk factors for an exacerbation of their disease process, et cetera? As you start to peel back, you can then say, this is where we need to target this particular patient population. If you look at other measures that we have in the ED left without being seen, if you look at a clinic and the, the no-show rate, if you look at hospital um, wanting to know why they're having increased costs related to medication, if you peel back each one of those with deeper data, you will start to find out 
what you need to do in a particular community. Some health systems, hospitals may say, I don't know how to do that. You don't have to know how to do that. This is when you partner with community organizations who are deeply rooted in a particular community who can do that legwork for you. For instance, I know of a health system right now that's looking at food as a prescription. They're identifying those particular patients who need to be very mindful of their diet in a heart failure population. They're tracking their, their current status as it relates to heart failure exacerbations, medication compliance, et cetera. They're partnering with a community um, organization who's actually delivering the food, ensuring the food is kept properly and cooked properly. And then there's a feedback loop that comes back to the primary care physician to know whether or not that patient has benefited from the program. So I think one of, one of the key areas to understand is each part of the healthcare ecosystem plays a role. And if they're partnering with the other part in the ecosystem, together, we can truly decrease these inequities that we're seeing. And I think that's the key part to remember. One part of this equation doesn't have to do it all. And that's why it's so important to bring that data together and use it for that targeted intervention. You know, David, I'm, I'm thinking as I hear Angela talk, um, this does provide an economic incentive, not the usual one we think of in fee for service, but many organizations and healthcare has been the last bastion to move to the cloud. Uh, right. Every other industry did that quite some time ago. Um, but this, the cloud costs are an important cost. And so this provides a, a, an important initiative. But Angela just said something very important. She described a closed loop referral. And I remember in my days practicing primary care, if I would send someone to the cardiologist, I would want to know if they got there and I'd want to know what the assessment was and I'd want to have uh, knowledge back and feedback from the cardiologist. Uh, and, and that, I never would have thought in those days that that would happen with a community agency or a food prescription. Uh, David, right. is, there hope, is there hope here on how some of these new measures may be tracked and how we can bring the systems together? Well, I sure hope so. I, I think the other part of this question that jumps out at me is, you know, um, what are some of the measures? Uh, uh, right now, we have a lot of different sorts of SDOH measures. Uh, you know, basic stuff, your zip code, average annual income, uh, your credit score, all of which are very important. Credit score turns out to be an incredibly predictive measure of your compliance and adherence to medication as one instance. But David, I, I think we have to step back for a moment. Uh, the way you and I were trained in, in, in Angela too, but you and me in particular, 40 plus years ago, I mean, I never once asked anybody what's in your refrigerator. <laughs> Did you have any trouble getting to see me? I mean, my physician daughter at 34, She's had that a part of her training, but my doctor wife and I never had any of this. It was all about the tyranny of the visit. You're damn lucky to come to see me and uh, you know, take a seat and take a ticket. And when we get to your one problem, one patient, one at a time, we'll take care of whatever it is that ails you. Uh, well, clearly that ain't working. So what are the measures? Well, where should we start? You, you know, it, it, is it zip code, income, education level, or to me, pretty basic stuff, transportation, or maybe even before that, do you have a place to live? And do you have food? And do you have a way to get here? Let's start with that. And building those measures into the electronic medical record and making it accessible, searchable, and build some artificial intelligence into this so we could say, well, these 10 patients from this zip code are way sicker than these matched case controlled 10 patients with the same clinical problem from this zip code as one example. So to me right now, this reminds me of the quality and safety work that I've done for 30 years, meaning we have so many measures for quality and safety, most of which now clinicians don't pay any attention to because they're overwhelmed. I sure hope it doesn't happen with the SDOH measures, meaning we're gonna have so many measures that nobody really pays any attention. I, I would make one other comment, just going back to Kelly's comment. Well, you know, Medicaid managed care has a great aligned economic incentive to care about everything we've been talking about. 
um, go upstream, shut that faucet, as you alluded to, instead of mopping up the floor and get the patients the food and the housing because it's going to cost a bundle if you don't address those issues. That's really the key and why Medicaid managed care is so aligned with the social determinants. But to answer question two, I'm concerned. We're going to have, if you would, a Robert Wachter measurement mania like we had for quality and safety with the social determinants. And I know we're going to get to that later. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, just having a measure is one step, but then doing something with it is another. So. Uh, well, of course. And then, uh, sadly, for guys and gals of my vintage, uh, you know, it's too late. You're going to have to train a different generation with different tools to tackle the social determinants. It, I think we're going to have to have a self-realization that we need to change medical education, nursing education, pharmacy education to the, even put this stuff into the curriculum. Otherwise, nobody's going to pay attention to it uh, either. Uh, no, this is awesome. Uh, Callie, uh, uh, I, I was thinking when David talked, I do remember in my medical school training, which I will not give the data, but I still remember going out with the EMT, the emergency medical team squad, and going into sure. a room the first time, and I saw safety issues. I did open the refrigerator, which was kind of moldy, and I saw an awful situation, and I found very quickly, because they taught me where the shoebox was, under the bed, or in the kitchen cupboard with the medicines. And I saw right. all different types of hospitals and doctor prescriptions, and some of them were full and two years old. And I remember thinking, there seems to be important information here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Kelly, fast forward to today in the community, uh, are we seeing progress? And more important to the question at, at hand, are there measures being used to say, uh, are we measuring things that seem to be relevant or important to the question at hand around uh, health disparities in access? Good, good question. And I think we are making progress. Um, and I, I am taken back a, several years ago when the accountable care community's work came out of CMMI. And it was really interesting because I remember sitting there reading through this, getting really excited because for once we're going to incentivize providers for, for um you know, screening patients for all these social determinants of health. And then I literally remember sitting in my chair, taking a breath and going, wait a minute. The very first thing I was afraid I was going to hear from my provider colleagues was, okay, great. I'll screen every patient. Now you're going to pay me for it. Two thumbs up. But then what am I supposed to do with them? Right? Because our, our community-based organizations are overwhelmed already. They're wait lists. And for, for our patients, one of the things that we hear a lot of is that's a complex system to navigate. If I go here for a food resource and I need to go there for a transportation resource and I need to go over to this place to help with my electricity bill, they're all requiring different information. They all have different criteria for eligibility. Why should it be that hard? So we're spending so much time and energy and effort Patients get tired of the system that they're trying to navigate just to get help um, for the things that they need to get help for. So I, I do think, one, we are making progress in terms of, of measuring, right? We are starting the screening process, so creating awareness. To, to Angela's point, we're getting data for the first time. Yeah, I see that there's a comment about, you know, urban versus rural, and I think there are going to be some fascinating things that we learn about what are the differences in, in urban settings than rural settings? There isn't broadband, so you, you I think you mentioned it earlier. We can't do telehealth um, as much in the in those urban uh, in the rural settings. You know, our cities, a lot of them have public transportation, but in our rural counties, they don't. Or wait, if they do, they can't cross county lines, which doesn't do us any good when the, you know, the the nearest facility that a patient can be seen at is, you know, 30, 45 minutes, an hour away. Um, and, and so one of the things, again, kind of the, the work that we're doing in North Carolina as a part of the care management infrastructure of these healthy opportunities is they are actually the ones screening patients and determining eligibility 
four different programmatic resources. So it's, it is kind of taking it out of the hands of the physician. I love my physician colleagues. I work with them every day, but we don't need to rely on physicians to have to do one more thing. Let's build systems around them to support them that allows our physician colleagues to work at the top of their license, treating, screening, that kind of thing. And then handing them over to care managers who quite frankly, ours live in the communities that they serve. So they know the resources. So they know if a patient is a diabetic patient that they need to go to this food bank, not that food bank. Um, and that they are kind of that center cog of the wheel, so to speak, to make sure that one, the patient is informed that they're a trusted resource. Because that's the other thing. I mean, I think about the humility that a lot of patients have to have to say, no, I don't have food. Not just for me, but I know in our population, there's a lot of moms that are afraid to say that because then they're afraid something's going to happen to their children. Um, so you know, just kind of the system that's around them um, you know, a care manager, a care coordinator can be that trusted resource, a community health worker who then knows the community, knows the resources, knows the best resources for that patient. And then they're committed, not just to that patient, but to their community, because they are the patients that they are the people that they see at the grocery store and that are sitting in the school at the PTA meeting next to them and that kind of thing. So I think when we talk about communities coming together, you know, around social determination, of health. It, to Angela's point, it really is everybody coming together around a goal aligned purpose. Um, but I think the when I think about measurement too, is we have to think this is a marathon. This is not a sprint that we're in. And I think that when we talk about disalignment of incentives, you know, there are grant funds that are out there and, and we all get really excited about them. But what are we really going to be able to track and measure effectively in, in a two, three, four year time period? It may not be a whole lot. Um, we're going to be able to measure some of those process measures, you know, how, how did we in, do in terms of screening patients, referring them, and ideally getting that closed loop. But I think we need to be committed as healthcare leaders into those longer term outcomes measures. It's going to be 15, 20 years before we begin to see a shift and understanding that it does take everybody, you know, it starts with the medical education, it starts with our, involving our community-based organizations, our patients to understand what they want to be involved in before we're going to see that long-term change that we so desire. Now, this is, this is a great conversation. Uh, you know, I want to highlight a number of times it's come up about this economic incentive, business incentives, and I would also add, I'm hearing cultural change issues. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how can we make this good sense for the businesses at hand, the health systems, the health plans, the community agencies? How do we make good business sense. So, uh, you know, Kelly, you've talked about the, uh, some of the programs that the state has put in, in place, you know, there's Medicaid waivers. I think a couple of people have brought up in the chat about value-based pricing. And then Angela, and I'd like to start off with you, you've talked a little bit about making uh, cloud credit costs back to the health system to help reduce and fray costs for them addressing this issue. Uh, Angela, with your perspective and the work you're doing around that, mm -hmm. You know, where do you see health systems struggling with and the impact that can be made of efforts like you're doing and some of these uh, value-based, you know, contracting waiver programs from the state? How much impact do you see them happening and where do you see this going? Sure. So I see health systems struggling with where to start. And many times you're thinking about what's the really big idea instead of just starting with the basic interventions that can make a difference. So if you can ensure that you have all the data. So right now you have information from the electronic health record. You have information that may have come in from a portal or the website that the patient put in. You have information that um, from a community benefit standpoint, there's been a community uh, needs assessment that's been done. All of that information is sitting somewhere within the health system or hospital. And if you bring it all together, it can give you a direction. Once you have that information, then you can decide where do I need to go? Is it just, do I need to make some changes so that I'm capturing information from the patient to access the clinic or the hospital in a different way? Do I need to make sure that I'm collecting it in the language that they understand? Do I need to make sure that my case managers and social workers, once they get the information, can easily access it and appropriately refer that patient to community resources? Do I already have a partner in the community through the community benefits office or another major organization like the United Way or others in the, in the community where I can easily send off a referral? 
you can only have that if you have the information. So many times within a system, it's you're data rich, but information poor. Mm. We need to bring all of that together. For the vast majority of health systems, they're going to have to modernize how they collect data to bring it together. That's where AWS comes in. This digital transformation, this commitment we've made to help with health equity by getting folks started on this journey can really make a difference. It is true that as a profession in healthcare where we lay hands on people and we're helping them get better, there's a lot of responsibility. But what we have learned, especially over the last two years, is that that doesn't have to be done alone. And really coming together with other entities can help make you much more successful as you start to think about health equity. Uh, great comments and about the need to have people work together to forge relationships. You know, I was in a discussion the other day about how the pandemic brought together payer provider, life science companies and government agencies to create a vaccine that didn't exist before and treatments that didn't exist before, deploy them and have people on, you know, using them at, at significant percentages, 70, that's never been happened before. You know, that 17 year gap that, you know, we learned about from the Institute of Medicine just shriveled when people worked together. And so uh, they obviously had the uh, initiative of panic <laughs> and crisis, but uh, Kelly, we have uh, technology now. I know that uh, you often work with us, with Innovacer, you deal with data, some of the measures that we've talked about. And you also deal with one of the things that people in the chat have brought up, the difference between the rural community and the urban issues that David uh, described. Uh, where do you see this coming together around collaboration? So I, I think Angela is spot on. It is really around goal alignment, um, you know, and I know that there are lots of things that have to come together in order to make that happen. I think enhancing this and the acceleration of this move towards value, um, regardless of the payer contract, you know, Medicare, a lot of times it's out front or Medicare Advantage plans, Medicaid is there. I think the 1115 waivers that, are, that exist there are a great innovation space for work like this to happen. And I think, you know, we have partnered with Innovacer to do a lot of work. One of the things that was really intriguing to us was the ability to look at social vulnerability and knowing that, you know, we have this kind of mark of a measure. How does that align with as, as our care managers are talking to patients every day? How does that align with what they're seeing in, in their screening process? And even back to David Nash's point earlier is, you know, I think we all oftentimes in healthcare have looked at the risk of a patient, right? Like we, we look at a patient that is high risk because they have a chronic medical condition, a chronic need, that kind of thing. We, or myself specifically, I, I hope that we are getting closer to a point of not only assessing risk, but need. Because if I have a population of folks, even if they don't have any risk factors yet, but they are high need, they will eventually be a high risk patient for us. So to ever get upstream, we really do have to start looking at that need. And I, I almost envision it as a little bit of a four quadrant model, so to speak, of you know our, our biggest and, and uh, most accelerated target should be that high risk, high need patient. But then where do we balance out with the high need, low risk patient right now? Again, that they may not have a chronic medical condition, but if they have a need, they're going to end up utilizing our healthcare system likely in ways that we didn't want them to do it anyways. You know, I, I'm, by early days in healthcare, I remember getting called down to the emergency room patient was there um, and, and quite frankly was there for socialization and a warm place to sleep and a, a meal because they would get that while they were there. There, there wasn't any um, immediate medical need for that patient to be there. Um, and so again, that, that is cost quote unquote, to our healthcare system, they could have easily been addressed had there been goal alignment and a recognition and identification through data of the need of that singular patient or the needs in a community that could be easily addressed ahead of time. All uh, right, you know, I th this has been such a rich discussion with so many different angles and uh, the, the discussion of the challenges that sit in front of us. You know, uh, we talk about economic incentives, we've talked about uh, connections and, and getting collaboration. You know, one of the issues around cultural change, though, is we're training a new workforce. And David, I know this is true to your 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 heart because you know you go to college. Uh, you've you've always been an academic uh, a, a physician who's interested in training the next generation of physicians. Um, where do we see 
training today and where do we see in an academic medical center the interest in tackling these problems as well as the uh, training efforts made? Well, so thanks, David. We're making progress, uh, not just at Jefferson, but at a host of the big places putting this material into the curriculum. The good news is uh, millennial aged medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students care a lot about these issues. Uh, uh, they grew up with this. They understand it. Uh, they understand the a racial component. They, they want to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Um, I think the challenge has been a sufficient number of faculty who have the expertise to teach this. Uh, we're, of course, fortunate at our place. We have our textbook now in its fourth edition, uh, Population Health, Creating a Culture of Wellness. We have our journal, Population Health Management, a peer-reviewed scholarly journal, the only one of its kind in the country. So, I think the scholarship of population health is going to go uh, be a part of the solution here. Uh, but, you know, aligning this with uh, business success, I, I keep coming back to full capitation for payer contracts. Uh, David, you and I, in December of 2019, before the pandemic, we introduced that clunky term, the pay vider. Uh, it's a combination of payer and provider. To me, that is a step in the correct direction, which we have to mention here. And that, sure, if you're a standalone Medicaid managed care plan, you will get that. But if you're a big academic medical center, you know, there's really 150 medical school academic medical centers, and then, you know, another six or 700 members of the Council of Teaching Hospitals. Well, they don't really, quite frankly, understand a lot of this, and we get it. They need a partner where, for whom that's the core mission, a uh, payer. So a payer provider, pay provider, joint venture, and they come in different flavors. That's a step in the right direction here too. So summary, I think it's the curriculum. I think it's training sufficient faculty and having the right structure like a pay provider that mm -hmm. begins to get at some of these issues. It's not gonna solve the rural health problem anytime soon. Um, I guess my last comment on this is just something that Kelly said, you know, she said 15 to 20 years. Well, I, I politely disagree. Uh, uh, the Medicare trust fund, if we do nothing different, nothing different between now and 2027, the Medicare trust fund is going to be bankrupt. So, uh oh, <laughs> that's five years, not 15 or 20. So we better get on it. And I know that CMS wants by 2030, everybody in a value-based payment contract. Well, I, I think that's way too long in the future. I would advocate move up the deadline, make it a hell of a lot sooner and get people organized to pay, you know, uh, to keep people out of the damn hospital rather than in the hospital. Uh, but I hope I'm still around to see it. That's my, that's my current wish. <laughs> okay. Those are great comments. And, you know, this has been such a fantastic discussion. We've talked about um, the need and recognition of the need. Uh, certainly, you know, as some people in the chat have pointed out, hospitals are just bewildered about what to do right now uh, because we've all seen the issue. We know what it, it has a big impact, but the question is what to do. We've talked about data the ability to bring data in. And we've talked about quality measures because you can't manage what you can't measure. And then the Indeed. question of how do, you, how do you take that information and make it real? So, um, you know, just a quick, I know David, uh, we were all talking before, here are some health equity measurement approaches that have been positioned. And I am gonna open it up for people to make some comments here um, uh, just to see what you think of this. Does this allow somebody to start heading in the right direction. Uh, let's start yeah. with you, Dave. Yeah, so I love this uh, slide and kudos to the team for putting this together. Uh, I guess I have two reactions. You know, one, great job. Uh, two, this is an incomplete list. <laughs> so, you know, there's, of course, the Innovator tool. Uh, there's the Vizian Vulnerability Index and five academic medical centers that are working on that. Uh, there are a couple of for-profit companies that have their own proprietary social determinative health, you know, secret sauce. 
So again, um, which one is going to have hegemony over the others? I don't know, but we better figure that out. And number two, uh, which ones connect to the you know extant EHR that most of us are using, Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, and the rest. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work going on here, but I'm not sure any one of these is you know going to come out on top, or maybe any two or three or four of these. Uh, so a lot of energy, but I'm not sure that uh, I think it was Angela who said lots of data, not too much information, and I'm worried that we're going to have the same issue with the all of these amazing measures, uh, how do they work? And then I guess uh, the researcher in me is, wants to ask the question, well, which one does the best job, right? What's reproducible at a low cost that gets us to a good outcome in an efficient and effective way? Uh, uh oh, I, we don't know. So we better get busy on focusing on which of these measurement tools is going to be the most effective tool, uh, you know, in the short term and long term. Angela, great comment, David, reference you made earlier. Uh, here you are. Here's some measures. Here's some work being done. Uh, where do you think things are today? I know. I, I think we should assign this to Amazon to figure out. That's what I think. That's a great <laughs> idea. Let's do that. Right. Great. Love it. Well, the one thing I would say is let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, any one of these tend to get started and to continue to improve from there. One of what happens to us so many times is that we're so focused on having the perfect answer that we don't get started. We know we can't wait any longer to ensure that the care we're providing is equitable. So we need to just dive in and get started. If you don't know where to start, take one of these measurement approaches, one of the others that, that David mentioned, and get started. And if you don't know where to get started, that's absolutely why people like me and the team I'm on are here, is to help you get started with how do I bring this data together so I can impact the population that I serve. Um, there's so much more to learn, David, I absolutely agree. Um, collecting the data, having the right interventions is one part. Everything that you talked about early, earlier in terms of how are we teaching this? Who are the faculty? Do they understand the impact? I mean, ultimately, we're still kind of an apprentice model. We're as good as those who taught us. And so it really is important for all of us to understand the importance of this work and ensure that, that the entire healthcare ecosystem is engaged and committed to making sure that, that we improve um, health equity. That's great. Yeah, you know, it makes me wonder, Kelly, are, are you seeing people in North Carolina beginning to measure? I know I've heard uh, some of our clients in large urban areas are building health equity and disparity dashboards that their uh, operational team is looking at every day and then using that to drive efforts uh, to reduce and close those gaps. What are you seeing in North Carolina? So we are starting to see a lot of that. Again, a lot of it initiated through the, the transition to Medicaid managed care. And, and I do think that COVID too taught us that we have to, to look at things differently. And so it is figuring out how do we collect data from lots of different sources to Angela's point earlier, you know, organize it in a way that then can be utilized to kind of tell a story, tell a value proposition. And, you know, I would talk with a lot of community-based organizations and I'm like, no, now is your time. Like, you know, I, I understand that for a long time you've been living grant to grant um, and funding source to funding source. And, you know, one week you're open and the next week you're not. But now is the time to understand the value that they bring to the healthcare ecosystem because they, they have a story to tell and being able to utilize that story and how they are servicing patients. So, yeah, I think we are starting to see one, an intentional benefit from community-based organizations um, in a way that we haven't seen before of them starting to understand, oh, we actually do need to know so that we got a referral for this patient, that we saw the patient, they actually showed up, we got them the service that they needed or that was required or requested for them, that they knew what to do with it, um, you know, whether it was food storage or how to prepare the meal or um, that they actually got the transportation that was needed and, and that the provider who made that referral knows that it happened. Um, I mean, and then it's coming back to that whole closed loop system, I think is so important. But, you know, and I, I agree with Angela, and that's why I said I think so much of it is 
just start somewhere, you know, and being in a part of the community and getting out into the community is just such an invaluable way. I mean, again, I think that we can all make a lot of assumptions and we can wait forever for data, um, but we could still be here waiting, right? Um, whereas again, to your point, you know, lots of different multi-sector groups came together around COVID response. So why are we not doing the same thing around food, you know, food insecurity? Or why are we not doing the same thing around transportation or leveraging existing infrastructures that exist in our community? I mean, we're seeing some fun things with UPS and, and other things that are already alive and active in our community. So we don't have to go and recreate the wheel. Let's leverage what's already there because there is more than enough work that needs to be done that we don't have to tackle it. The health system alone doesn't have to tackle it. I think what we have to do is have a recognition of the need by understanding our community, listening to the community, and then pulling together the right people. So, I mean, I think the big role that a lot of times healthcare providers and systems can play, if nothing else, is being the convener of the, the different parties and stakeholders in the community and around to pull them together around that table together. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I I want to uh, also just thank you all for uh, Kelly and David for mentioning the social vulnerability index we've done here at Innovacer, where we've been working on this for four years with our data science teams, our various AI initiatives, really bringing together issues around uh, food security, housing, uh, you know, transportation, and being able to display that at a zip code level and help care managers and physicians and others get actionable information, data activation at the point of care. Um, so great discussion. Um, you know, one of the things that's always new for us is getting that consumer data as well, right? The data about what do people do around their shopping and their credit score and those things are so important. I still remember David Nash saying uh, several years ago when we were doing one of these webinars that the two biggest drivers, right, of health outcomes, zip code and credit score. Got it. Still true. There we go. Still true. So uh, any, I just want to just, if you could each just give us a closing comment, I want to thank certainly the audience for coming here today, uh, for each of you. Uh, uh, let's just start with you, Kelly, then Angela, then David. Uh, Kelly, a few closing, just a sentence or two. Yeah, again, I, I'd like to thank the Innovator team for pulling this together, and it has been just a fun and exciting discussion this afternoon. Um, I, I think more than anything, what, what we would want to portray as an Imtero Health Company is that a commitment to our community and to driving health equity forward is going to be what it really takes for all of us coming together to improve health outcomes, stronger communities, um, and, and the equity that we strive to see. So I'm, I'm glad to see the participation this afternoon. I hope that there'll be lots of follow-up conversations and discussions as a result. Awesome. Angela? I share exactly what Kelly just said in terms of thankful to the Innovator team for bringing us together. This has been a great discussion. I want people to be able to move fast, to really use um, data, use it to turn it into information that ends up being insights that allows you to move fast and really help those communities that you want to serve. And so looking forward to ongoing conversations about health equity and how we really eliminate any of those disparities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, David, great to do one of these again with you. Closing you remarks. Bet. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I hope I'm around to see some of these changes get implemented. That That's my wish, right? I'm right there with you. Indeed. Uh, thank you all. Great panel. Great uh, participation from the audience on the chat. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Let's go forth and make some of this data actionable. You got it. Thanks again. Thanks. Great to be together. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye, Angela. Bye, Kelly. Bye. Bye.